Thanks a lot, Francisco. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about this idea of multimodal general anesthesia. I'm going to go through what we've called sort of the theory, but it's 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 an arbitrary division because. I'm going to have some theoretical ideas in some cases, and then also Marusa is going to have some theoretical ideas in some cases as well. Um, but here are the main points that I want to make. Uh, I'm going to just go back quickly through the signatures that I talked about this morning. I want to suggest a way to think about um, doing what we call multimodal general anesthesia. And for us in the United States, it's a problem because uh, we have a real problem with opioid overdose. Uh, op op opioid abuse. And uh, although it's not the only contributing factor, the prescription of opioids by in the perioperative period is one component of it. And to the extent that we can change that, it would be important. But then even beyond that, I, I, I think that I've learned a lot in the last couple of years. It, is it possible to turn this volume down there a little bit? Thanks. I, I've learned a lot in the last couple of years about uh, and thinking about the um, <laughs> okay, maybe that's a little better. All right. So I've learned a lot in the last couple of years about. Um, how to think about anesthesia, and I'm going to share some of those ideas with you. And a good number of them were motivated by my conversations with Marusa, and you, you, we'll make that clear. So these are my colleagues that I've had the good fortune to work with. Marusa Naranjo, who you're going to hear from shortly. Patrick Purden at Mass General. Kara Pavone is one of our research assistants. One of my colleagues, Basavana Guda Gudra, who is at UPenn, and also Shiona Keiju. So um, Marusa came up to spend time with me at Mass General about two years ago because she had been telling me that she'd been doing all this work for about the last six or seven years prior to that doing opioid free anesthesia. And you know, she was telling me these things and I was listening, but it, it didn't take hold. I didn't appreciate like, you know, how important, I mean it really was prescient, you know, these ideas that she was having and, and that, you know, she was uh, testing out herself in, in Merida. And so then I said, you know, we kind of need that here. So she came up to visit me in Boston, and we spent a week, and then we spent time just brainstorming things out on the board, you know, putting out like what we saw as clinical features and trying to work out like some sort of theory to, to sort of pull this all together. And from that is a publication which is coming out shortly in Anesthesia and Analgesia, which is called Multimodal General Anesthesia Theory and Practice. So it should be out in a few weeks or so. So I'm going to tell you basically how we came up with these ideas. So this is the definition of general anesthesia. And uh, Francisco, do you have a pointer? Yes, it's, I think it's there. Yeah. I've got it, yeah, thank you. So this is a definition of general anesthesia. So this reversible state, and the one thing which I would change here, I'd make this anti nociception for the reason that I said this morning. So we have these conditions, unconsciousness, amnesia, analgesia, akinesis, and stability of the physiological systems. So what I would argue is, is that just a very simple idea. You need anesthesia not because someone should be unconscious. You need anesthesia because it hurts. So the emphasis should be on trying to control the nociceptive circuits. And then what you'll see is that if you get good control of the nociceptive circuits, then you'll get some degree of decrease arousal or unconsciousness, which you can take advantage of, and it reduces the amount of the hypnotics that you have to give. That's kind of the basic idea behind this. And so operationalizing that, and then it goes a bit further in that the mistake, opioids themselves are not bad. What's bad is using just opioids. And so the idea then is if you have other drugs that you combine together in order to do the, to control the nociception, then you can, and if they're attacking the pain system at different points, that's the main idea, they're hitting the pain system at different points, you get this sort of synergistic effect and then you can reduce the amount of uh, hypnotic that you would use or inhaled ether, all right? So the way we do balanced general anesthesia at the moment is, I mean, I mean you all know just as well as we do, as I do, that um, you pick typically a drug like Actually, just to be very frank, the typical anesthetic at Mass General Hospital 
is not very creative. Most people are using sevoflurane and a little bit of dilaudid, you know, hydromorpha. That's it, you know. And then you hurt more, you get more. You wake, you're, you're waking up, you get more sevoflurane. That's basically it. And there, there, as you know, in the United States, there's no TCI. So we don't have nearly the experience that you all have in Europe or like folks have in South America with you, you know, using TCI or TIVA. So there's very, very little of that. And then you know, combining in you know, the anticholinergics for mobility, again, if you're unconscious, you don't really worry about amnesia, and then hemodynamic stability. So that's basically what we do. All right? So just to go back to something we talked about earlier today, because this is going to be a good part of this. In order to really do this, you have to have a good sense of where the person is, how unconscious he or she is. And so these are these various states that I went through earlier today. And what I'm going to focus in on here is this state here, the slow and alpha oscillations, which comes about from propofol and also from the inhaled ethers. All right? And so this is a state, all of these states here, so both empirically and by studying a relationship of these states with other states of coma, we're very comfortable in the idea that people are unconscious. So if you have one of these states, the people are going to be unconscious. And seemingly that maybe just getting to this one is sufficient. All right? You don't need to be in birth suppression to be unconscious. Now, and just to remind you of something that I didn't uh, go over today, and, and it's going to be important for what I'm going to say now. If you had raw EEG trace, a raw EEG trace, and then you knew which frequency bands you wanted to pull out, you could just apply a filter to it. And let's say, like here, you can see there's a low frequency component there, so you could pull out this low frequency component. Or if you wanted to pull out this higher frequency component, you could have a filter that went at around 10 hertz. You could just pull those out. But what happens is, is that the frequencies that are relevant change through time. Or it might not be right at 10. It might be up about 11 or 15. Or it might be lower down if you're older, like 6 to 8. So instead of doing that, what we do is we compute the spectrum, which is taking the Fourier transform of the data, taking the square modulus of it, smoothing it a bit, and here is this, and plotting here power, which is effectively the amplitude squared, a transformation, the log of the amplitude squared of the signal on the, X, on the Y axis. Then here is frequency. So if you look here, there's a big low frequency component, something between 0 to about 2 hertz. And that's this thing here, meaning 2 cycles per second. That's this. And then over here, there's something around 10 hertz which is the signal which is here extracted, or you can see the high frequency part in this signal here. And then basically in this signal, there's really nothing beyond 15 hertz of any consequence. Now, that's one about 10 seconds of data. So what you have to do is you have to continually do that through time. So you're sliding a window along doing that in time. And when you do that, you get something that looks like this. You get the, you get this, this black line here is that one. And if I slide it along in time, I'm getting roughly the same thing which, with some degree of variability. So here is that mountain right there. There's the valley. There's this other mountain here. And here's basically the sea out there. All right? So there's time on this axis here. So you can watch this through time. So that's the spectrogram. That's what's being computed. But the way you look at it, though, is from a helicopter view. You look at it as if you're flying over the top of it. So if I fly over the top of this mountain range in this valley, it would look like this. All right? And so this is what you see on the monitor over time. There's the low frequency component. There's the 10 hertz component. And this is a 2D representation of this 3D picture here. And so this is what you track over time. This is a classic signature of propofol in someone who has a fairly young brain. All right? And so the idea then is instead of looking at propofol like this, or sevoflurane like that. And you know, if we look hard, we can probably see, yeah, there are some differences in the frequencies or what have you. But where the spectrogram helps you out is if you plot it like this, you can see that this is quite different from that. That's different from this, and, and so on. And it makes it easier to understand. And, and in fact, what I do in the operating room is I go back and forth between the two. I have, you know, I have a display that might show them both, or I, you know, I hone in on one or the other. But it's not one or the other. It's the two together, because what you're trying to do is extract as much information as possible. And the key point that I was making this morning is that these are not epiphenomena. 
right? They're related to how the drugs are actually working in the brain because we've done a lot of work to infer how you can generate these oscillations based on actual circuit dynamics in, in the human brain and also by doing experiments in, in monkeys. So behind this is this. For each drug, and we went over a little bit this morning, we can do detailed circuit analyses and say why we see what we see. So the point that I want to make, I, I don't want you to feel like I just go out and memorize some patterns. If you're able to get this intuition behind it, you'll, have, you'll be able to make inferences in using the EEG, and it's not just pattern recognition. I think that's very important. And then the one final just background point I want to make again is that it doesn't stay stable with age, but it changes very, very dramatically. So pediatric anesthesiologists need to obsess about brains that look like this. You know, those of us who take care of older patients need to obsess about brains that look like that. Right? So it, and, and it makes a lot of sense. As I mentioned this morning, you know, one of the key things when people talk about where the indices break down, they usually point out like drugs like ketamine, dexmedetomidine, nitrous, and they also point out kids. And as I mentioned this morning, if you're building a monitor that has an index and it takes a ratio of, let's say, power from here to power here, so let's just make it extreme. Let's say you're taking the ratio here. So this is very low here. This is rather high. So if you take this over that, that's going to be a small number. Now you come over here to a kid, and you take the ratio of this over that, it's going to be a very, very big number. And so pediatric anesthesiologist seeing that goes, oh my god, if I hadn't put this monitor on, I wouldn't have questioned whether the kid was out. I would have known he's out. But now that you've put this monitor on, you know, you've got me freaking out. So they won't use it. But, but the problem is, is that the monitor built for these folks is not the monitor built for those folks. That's the issue. But you can see that if you look at it in the spectrogram. All right? You can see it's the same dynamics. All right. So let's just move right to a case. All right? So this was a lady I took care of about four or five years ago. And the surgeon just needed to do an examination under anesthesia. And so um, he said, you know, just a little propofol, quick exam, and, you know, she'll be out. You know, we're really talking five minutes. So he gave her 100 of propofol. And, uh, you know, he said, I, I can't do my exam. So he gave her another 50. He says, I still can't do my exam. So I gave her another 50, and he goes, I'm done. I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's never happened to you, all right? So, OK, fine. So I, I didn't realize the importance of this until actually a few years later, because we're so used to using the EEG. When I looked at the EEG, I said, she's in birth suppression. So I just said, we're going to be here for a while, because she's just like super deep. I mean, this amount of propofol, you know, maybe she goes into a little bit of birth suppression, but you know, she was deep. But if you look what happened, she stayed in birth suppression for eight or nine minutes. Then she finally comes out into the alpha and slow oscillation pattern. And she didn't wake up over here for another 30 minutes. Now, I'm sure you'll agree that if a case like this had happened and you had no monitoring on somebody, you had no idea what was happening, they'd be telling you to call the neurologist, let's get a CT scan or MRI to see what happened. At least that, that's what would have happened in my hospital. And it was very clear what had happened. She just was super sensitive to the propofol. Bottom, bottom line, just sit here and wait. It's going to wear off, and then you know, we'll leave. And it is much longer than you'd expect. But by having the monitoring, it was very, very clear. All right? So if we're not using the EEG, what do we do? So this is something that it took me a while to get my head around. And what we're really doing when we take care of patients and we just look at heart rate and blood pressure to make a decision about which drugs to give, we're using this circuit, what I call the nociceptive autonomic medullary circuit. Right? And it's important to, to, to really appreciate, because I think that from day one, when residents show up to, learn to do their first class in anesthesiology, this is what we should put up there and show them and teach them, because this is what we do. All right? We don't use the EEG. We do this. And so by that, I mean the following. So the surgeon makes an incision here. All right? So he, he or she disrupts the free nerve endings, which are carried into the spinal cord, into the dorsal root ganglion by the alpha, delta, and C fibers. Then they synapse here in the spinal cord. They cross over. And this is called the, uh, the anterior fasciculus. And what you typically do is you draw this 
going up to the um, going up to the thalamus and on the cortex. But that's not the part which is really relevant for what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a very important synapse right here. See this guy, NTS. His name is Nucleus of the Tractus Solitarius. It's ironic, because he's anything but solitary. He's actually very friendly, right? He talks to everybody. Uh, or she talks to everybody, excuse me. She talks to everybody, all right? So this is talking to the parasympathetic system. So when you activate the nucleus of the tractus solitarius, let's say with a painful stimulus, you actually pull away the, sympathetic, the parasympathetic inputs, nucleus ambiguous going into the sinoatrial node. And in fact, the first part of the heart rate going up is not sympathetic activation. It's actually pulling away of parasympathetic inputs. Then, at the same time, you have a little bit of detail here, but just to say it once, you go through the caudal ventral lateral medulla, the rostral ventral lateral medulla, the synapses here in the, in the sympathetic ganglia, so then you see your increase in heart rate and your increase in blood pressure. In other words, that's what we do every time when we use heart rate and blood pressure to make an inference about what's happening in a patient. And this makes sense physiologically. It makes sense physiologically because from here, this is all part of the, 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 fight, the, the flight or fight response. Right? So we've been taking advantage of this, but we haven't named it. And I think it's very important conceptually to keep that in mind. All right, let's look at how this can get us into trouble, though. L let's just say cause issues, right? not necessarily trouble. So this is a case where I was helping one of my colleagues um, take care of a woman who's 68 years old, She's going to get sevoflurane, and she's going to have a mastectomy. And my colleague, I said, do you mind if I put the EEG on? She goes, no, no problem. She says, I don't use it. I said, that's okay. I said, I just want to record the data because we're putting together a database. She goes, okay, but just remember, I'm not using it. I said, no problem. Okay. I bet you're not going to use it, right? right. So she goes ahead with her case, sevoflurane. And here's the heart rate and blood pressure. Things are pretty stable, 52, 128 over 85, 99. Maybe a little chilly, but otherwise OK. Good pulse ox trace. So here's the EEG. All right. Now, I came into the room at 948 to give her a break. All right. And if you look here, you see this? She's in birth suppression. She's very deep. OK? Now, no one would argue with these numbers here. I mean, this looks like textbook anesthesia. She looks perfectly well anesthetized, stable heart rate, blood pressure. No one would quibble with that. It turns out she's much deeper from an unconsciousness state than she needs to be. Because look, she's in birth suppression. Suppression, birth, suppression. Now, it's even worse than that. This is 948 where I came in the room to give her a break. And the monitor is keeping track of how long she's been in birth suppression. See this little blue line down here? It goes all the way back to at least 9 o'clock. So she was in birth suppression at least till 9 o'clock, and I would argue even longer, all right? Much deeper than she basically needed to be. So you could have turned this down very, very easily if she were using the monitor. But again, using the nociceptive medullary circuit, this is her anesthetic management, all right? And, and like I said, no one would take issue with, with her for doing that because that's very standard. That's accepted clinical practice, all right? So this is what I just said there. But now, why does this matter? There seems to be more data accruing to suggest that patients who are in birth suppression for an extended period of time, particularly this study here, which is done by Michael Avedon at WashU, it came out about two years ago, showing that there is a strong relationship between post-operative delirium and extended periods of birth suppression. In this paper, they even found a relationship up to about five minutes or so. All right? So, and then, as we know, delirium is related to the likelihood of having post-operative cognitive dysfunction. So the back of the envelope statement is, Having someone too deep is probably not a good thing, but how can you know if they're not too deep? You need to be monitoring in order to make that statement. So, like I said, this is the current strategy. 
you know, we pull drugs from these different categories to achieve our state of balanced general anesthesia. And the idea of balanced general anesthesia makes a lot of sense because one of the things that we learned is if you use bits and pieces of different drugs, you have sort of more of the good effects and fewer of the side effects. I mean, we all know what it's like if you were to just use, let's say, sevoflurane to just do a complete anesthetic. It would, you'd have a lot of hypotension, perhaps tachycardia, et cetera, and certainly not very good analgesia control postoperatively. All right, so here's the idea that, that what you know, Marus and I have been thinking about. So the key thing should be to maximize ant anti nociception by targeting multiple sites in the nociceptive pathways. All right? So then you can take advantage of the fact that the nociceptive drugs also decrease arousal. So this will mean that you can adjust downward, typically, the hypnotic that you're using, your propofol, your sevoflurane, or whatever. This is a technical point that I just want to put in here. We can talk about it later. But the muscle relaxants also decrease arousal. We can go through details about why that happens. All right? And then it doesn't count if you spend all this time working out a beautiful multimodal strategy, and then you don't carry out a multimodal strategy into the postoperative period. It should be a multimodal strategy into the postoperative period, and then some plan to send the patient home on something which is multimodal or, or, or trending away from opioids. And again, as I said, opioids themselves aren't bad. Just using opioids by themselves is what gets us into trouble, at least has gotten us into trouble in the United States. All right, so let's look at a, let's look at a, a couple of uh, cases. So here's a woman we took care of a few, just a few, uh, about a year or so ago. She's 48 years old. She's having an examination under anesthesia, a laparoscopic hysterectomy, a left cell pingoephrectomy, and a cystos cystoscopy. She's about 160 centimeters. She weighs about 65 kilograms. And so this is the drug, the combination of use. Remy fentanyl, and these are the dose ranges. Ketamine, a half milligram per kilogram bolus and five mics per kilogram per minute. And then a background of dexmedetomidine. And when she was in steady state, she was getting propofol at 70 mics per kilo per minute. Right? And then cisatricurium for muscle relaxation. And then the postoperative pain management strategy is intravenous Tylenol, which is uh, Paracetamol here, thanks. So, so here, here are her vital signs. I mean, bradycardia, not surprising, given that she's on dexmedetomidine. Saturation looks good. Heart rate looks good. Temperature's fine. Good pulse ox trace. So here's her EEG, all right? So there's the, you can see she has very nice slow oscillations, alpha oscillations, and you can see them very well here in the, in the spectrogram. There's the alpha oscillations, there's the slow and delta oscillations. So I have no question about her being unconscious. And just to sort of show you her vital signs over time, they're actually quite stable here. And then when we were having her emerge, we turned back on the drug. And you can actually see here, you see how this trends up? The, the reason that happens, it looks like that, is that you're going from something which is like this in frequency to something which is this, and then like that. So it looks like, and then the lower frequency pieces are flattening out. So when you look at it, it looks like a zipper opening up. All right, the high frequency pieces dissipate to higher frequencies, and the lower frequency pieces flatten out. And if you look at this in the time domain, just to go back here one second, see how this is nicely modulated like that? When you get over here, when you get over here, see how it's, it's flatter? That's because the low frequency pieces are dissipating. It's also a tip during a case. You start seeing the low frequency pieces flatten out like that. The patient is coming too. And if you're running like one of these infusions, which is, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a small amount, you have to be very careful because they could wake up on you in two seconds, all right? So then just showing the same thing, just, and you see it's getting higher and higher frequency. You can see it, it's trending up. This is trending down. And so one of the things that I do as I'm watching patients come to is I do, um, I do a neuro exam on them. So l let's just go back to what I talked about this morning. Here are the arousal centers. There. Okay. And then there are, here's the, the respiratory group down here. And then down here, are, remember the, the corneal reflex, right? 
So you can take a wisp of, take a wisp of uh, cotton, or what I actually do in the operating room is just take a little drop of sterile water and just drop it on the eye. So it's very interesting to watch people when they're coming back from anesthesia. Because, you know, we're sitting there, we're kind of waiting, we're trying to act cool because we, we don't want the surgeons to know, we don't really know how deep they are sort of thing, but we just want to see what's coming back. And even the, the EEG can be ambiguous because what you'll see is the EEG says the cortex is ready. But we need to know also how the brainstem is coming back. So let's just go through that really quickly. If the person is breathing, right, the lower part of the brainstem is back. The respiratory centers have returned, all right? Now, if they're choking on the tube, all right, <laughs> they're gagging, then if you look right here, see this, this, nucleus, this nucleus ambiguous? This is the pharyngeal reflex, like the ninth and 10th cranial nerves, all right? Then if you now look at cranial nerves five and seven, so five and seven, they're further up, they're up here, okay? So that's the corneal reflex. You put a, drop of, put a drop of salt water on the eye itself, and the person should blink, and they should blink concentrically. And you'd be surprised, people don't blink. The top of their brainstem is still out. And you just follow them for a few more minutes, and boom, it comes back. And they may blink just on one side and not consensually. All right? So it gives you just a little bit more data. And it gets to be really, really important when you have a delayed wake up and you're trying to figure out you know, how deep someone is under anesthesia. But it's, it's very, very simple to do. And then the other thing, which is also quite simple to do, is just testing the oculocephalic reflex. So just turn the head, right? And what you'll see is that when the people are still anesthetized, their eyes are still in the midline, right? And people may come too, they may still talk to you, right? They may even answer your commands. They may squeeze your hands. But if you just check their oculocephalic reflex, it still may be out. And what that suggests is, even though the person, the person, the arousal centers here have not completely come to. Now, just to be clear, this is an inference, right? I'm making that inference by saying, oh, if a nucleus which is close to these arousal centers here is not, turn, is not turned back on, I'm going to infer that the arousal centers are not turned back on completely also. All right? But that's the same inference that neurologists make all the time when they're trying to, they look at the eyes not because they're interested in knowing about eye function, they're looking at the eyes because they're trying to make an inference about arousal circuits. My only point is that this is the, we should do the same thing. In fact, it's even better than that. In medical school, if we want to teach, like the medical students, the coma exam, the OR is the best place to do it. You do the exam before the person is induced. They have perfect findings. You, you anesthetize them. They go out. You watch them just before they come to. They don't have the findings again. Then they return when they, when they wake up. And you can do that five or six times a day where the students on the neurology service, it may take months for them to see a neuro exam change. All right? So just a couple of final points here. So just one other case. This lady, 77, and actually just took care of her a few, few weeks ago. And she's having this major operation. It's going to be um, taking out both kidneys. She has a kidney and transplanted. She has bladder cancer, so they're going to take out her bladder, and they're going to reconstruct her bladder with an ileal loop. All right? And so this is the combination of drugs we were using, very low dose of propofol, rocky rhodium for muscle relaxation, and erect a sheath block for pain afterwards. And so these are the hemodynamics. I just want to cut right to the, the EEG. Despite being on this very, very low dose of propofol, she's in birth suppression. I mean, she's just like super duper deep. I mean, I'm just really trying to give her very, very little. In fact, you can just see it. The spectrogram is all broken up here because she's just super deep. And just like the other lady, she was in there like a, a very long period of time. We just kept turning the drug back. In fact, we turned the drug back, the propofol back to 20. And she's still in birth suppression, right? So the amount of anesthetic that a lot of the older people need is much less than we've imagined, even when you take into account age-adjusted MAC or maybe even like your age-adjusted sort of TCI calculations. And here's just one more case. This is a 32-year-old guy who has had an incarcerated inguinal hernia and using propofol, dex, remifentanil, and here are his hemodynamics throughout the case. And with just, I forget, it was, yeah, just 75 of propofol, 
you know, he's got just rock solid alpha oscillation. You can see the modulation here, right? And this is, uh, see what's happening is the other drugs, remember propofol acts in the thalamus, excuse me, in the cortex, the thalamus, and the brainstem. When you give those other drugs, what they're doing is they're acting on Breme's principle. They're actually decreasing the excitatory inputs coming from the arousal system. That's why you don't have to give as much propofol to get the same propofol effect. I mean, this, I would argue that if you just gave this guy 75 of propofol, you would not be seeing rigid al alpha oscillations like this alone. You'd, you'd be seeing more like beta oscillations from sedation, all right? And so these are just the points that I was making. So if you look at the opioids, the opioids work to block the pain pathways, but they also block some component of sedation, like this cholinergic pathway here. The same thing is true, like if you look at ketamine, we talked about this earlier. Ketamine blocks this important glutamatergic pathway in addition to helping with pain. Or if you look here, like with uh, dexmedetomidine, the same thing. We discussed this this morning also. The same, the same idea, right? So it's blocking arousal, but it's also helping with pain as well. And then finally, the other drugs like lidocaine and also the non-steroidal the, uh, the non inflammatory drugs, you know, the, the jury's sort of out as to how lidocaine works. I mean, I've heard a couple of things. One idea is that what it does is it stabilizes the neutrophils so that when the neutrophils don't degranulate and amplify the, the inflammatory response. And I also learned from one of the medical students who did a lot of work out at Stanford that another mechanism that people are investigating is whether or not these NAV1 or 2 channels, like in the brainstem, particularly in the, in the, uh, the ventral periaqueductal gray, are actually being shut down and causing sort of a central effect. But the empirical observation is that adding lidocaine does help reduce, the, acts as a very effective adjunct. So here's just a summary of what I've just said. So if you maximize antinociception, okay, and then realize that the other drugs that you give help as well. So these drugs help here, not so much because they act directly on the nociceptors, but they alter the perception of pain. When someone has a colonoscopy, you don't give them pain medications. What you do is you give them something so they're sedated because you know it's not going to be pain that's going to last. All right? So that's the same thing here. You're getting that effect here as well. But what happens this, because of the antinociceptive effects, it has sedative effects. So these guys here together reduce the amount of propofol that you'll need. And then if you're using something, just as another case, if you're using something like magnesium, magnesium also is a very potent muscle relaxant, also relaxes smooth muscles, so you have to think about your blood pressure management and that sort of thing. But if you think about the explicit states and the implicit states, I think it's a very straightforward paradigm, right? And then, so this is what I've said, but to do this, you have to be able to use the EEG signatures to infer the state of unconsciousness. We think that this emphasis should be placed on explicitly on control of antinociception. It requires us to monitor unconsciousness, antinociception, and muscle relaxation to really guide this. So, you know, having you know, a monitor of pain in addition to a monitor of unconsciousness is going to be critical for us going forward, in my opinion. And what we've noticed, I mean, again, this is empirical. It hasn't been studied in some randomized controlled clinical trials. We have much cleaner wake-ups than, than with uh, just using the, at least the way we practiced anesthesia there at Mass General with just sevoflurane and dilaudid. And, and would suggest that maybe you would have, you reduce the post-operative cognitive effects of the GABAergic drugs. But all of this is not worth it if you don't have an organized plan to control pain, working with the surgeons going and sending the patient home. All right, so I'll stop there. Thank you.